Hi, and welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matthew J. Brown. This week we're talking about an article, uh, or a chapter rather, by Goldstein and Goldstein on uh, Jon Snow on cholera. Right? Um, this chapter gives us some interesting insight into the nature of the scientific process, and it tells the story of an important episode in the history of science and medicine, the sort of like founda founding um, episode or the, or the um, founding sort of uh, example of modern epidemiology. This case also, I think, helps us uh, uh, think about the historiography of science and medicine, that is, um, how the history is written. Um, and so that's actually where, um, where I'd like to start. And, um, you know, first, let's get this out of the way. Uh, we're talking about uh, not this Jon Snow, but this Jon Snow, okay? Um, so that's, uh, that's a pretty crucial uh, difference. So we're going to talk first about, you know, what is the history of science and, and how is it done, right? What are the, uh, what are the ways in which history, history of science is done? So history of science, maybe this is obvious, it's the study of the development over time of scientific knowledge. Um, whereas the historiography of science is the study of the methods of historians of science, uh, which is sort of what we're talking about now. Um, now, this week's reading is interesting insofar as it, uh, it leans heavily on Jon Snow's own words, right? Um, lots of long quotes from uh, Snow's original manuscripts. And for the most part, history um, works this way. It relies heavily on documentary evidence and archival evidence, the published and unpublished records uh, of the time, right? So this chapter, by quoting so heavily from Snow's own writing, gives you a good sense of what the work of the historian consists in, right? Looking at the historical record, uh, interpreting it, trying to understand what took place. Um, uh, you know, here we're getting a direct narrative from Snow. And, and as a piece of scientific writing, Snow's um, uh, is, is interesting and it's different from how science is often written today because Snow talks a lot more uh, uh, realistically and in detail about the process that he went through um, about the way the evidence was collected, the results that were obtained, also the way he thought through the issue and came up with his uh, ideas, right? So um, that's, a, that's a key element to um, how he wrote. Uh, it's not so common to write the scientific paper that way anymore, um, but it helps us reconstruct things, uh, historically speaking, a little more easily. Now, one approach to uh, uh, history, right, that many historians are opposed to is what's sometimes called Whig history or the Whig interpretation of history. You see this, uh, you see this um, term thrown a lot, around a lot, especially in history of science. Now, Whig history studies the past, um, not only in the context of the present, but uh, in order to glorify the present, right? It crafts historical narratives that, that not only center on the present, but treat the present as the, the product of an inevitable progression or even a her heroic progression, right? So Whig histories often have heroes and villains in them, right? The heroes who advance the progression towards uh, where we are now or the villains who stand in the way, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Whigs were a political party in the UK um, that uh, was particularly focused on, you know, the power of parliament over the power of the king and the, the details of that are not so important um, uh, but you can see how you know a kind of partisan history um, can present uh, present things uh, that favors the current arrangement right so in history of science this is a controversial issue um, you should science be presented as progressive, uh, or should the historian be neutral with respect to questions of progress is a key question for, his, for historians of science. Um, I mean, on the one hand, what they're talking about is the history of scientific knowledge, um, and knowledge is an achievement. So you might think, well, it's inevitable that you do some amount of Whig history. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, does that distort our understanding of what happened? So a major aspect of this is whether the historian should acknowledge that we, what we currently believe to be the truth of the matter, right? Um, and you see this in this chapter, right? The history of Snow's research is presented 
uh, you know, it's, it, early on with a bald statement, cholera is a bacterial disease. And we get a sense, you know, of what Snow got right and what Snow got wrong in our current lights, right? What he missed um, from the present understanding of the disease. Now, is this the right way to tell the history? Um, or should historians confine themselves to the information uh, that would have been available to Snow and others at the time as they try to understand what happened? That's a controversial question for historians of science. Um, and I don't have an easy answer for it, but it's something to think about. Um, you know, there's a, as an aside here, I think we can, we can ask um, about Snow's own telling of history because he begins his manuscript and the, and, the, and the chapter quotes from this uh, with a little bit of history, right? Snow says the existence of Asiatic cholera cannot be distinctly traced back further than the year 1769. Previous to that time, the greater part of India was unknown to European medical men, right? And so this is kind of the this is kind of the origin of of cholera, according to uh, uh, Snow, right? But um, you know it's worth thinking about what is the perspective that Snow is telling this history from? What kind of information is he leaving out? Um, how is he restricting uh, the materials he's looking at, right? Um, and that helps us sort of that's a sort sort of historiographic critique that's important to understanding um, the way history is understood historically, right? And uh, just as a hint, you know, you look at this passage and think, might there have been some people somewhere who knew something about cholera in India before the European medical men that Snow is referencing? So the the episode here uh, of, of Snow's research on cholera, I think it has a lot to, to tell us about um, the relationship between hypothesis and evidence in science. And there's two common ways we talk about this, uh, these, the relationship between hypothesis and evidence, right? The one is inductivism, right? It tells us that evidence kind of comes first and what scientific hypotheses are are generalizations from evidence, right? So um, you look at a number of um, scientists and philosophers have argued that the way that we come up with scientific knowledge is we look you know, at one example, two examples, three examples, you know, um, uh, this raven is black, that raven is black, that raven is black. Um, I've got, uh, you know, 400 examples of observations of ravens that are black. Therefore, um, all ravens are black, right? It's a kind of inductive leap. Um, the other kind of uh, common way we think about evidence in science is uh, what philosophers of science call hypothetico deductivism, right? Um, according to which the hypothesis comes first, right? That's the hypotheco. Um, and then we create tests to confirm or falsify the hypothesis based on the observational implications of the hypothesis. That's the deductivism, right? So we have a general a general claim like all ravens are black, and then we generate uh, a consequence of that, which is if we observe this raven, raven, it will be black, and then we test that, right? Um, and one of the things that is, I think, significant here is that um, these simple views just don't seem to fit with the story of Snow's research. So one of the things that evidence is used for um, in Snow's research is, is um, goes before even the notion of a hypothesis, um, is the sort of statement of the problem, right? What is the question that the research is trying to answer? Um, in order to really formulate that, Snow relies on all sorts of evidence um, of specific cases. Um, and uh, before he uh, posits an initial hypothesis, he presents evidence that sort of is suggestive of that hypothesis, right? Um, so the the problem in question, of course, uh, is you know what are the what are the causes of cholera and 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 its spread, right? And how can its spread be prevented? Um, the initial hypothesis has to do with the morbid matter um, that is uh, you know ingested from one person to another, um, that is sort of communicated and and ingested. Um, so Snow starts by gathering all sorts of evidence, comes up with a problem, comes up with a hypothesis. 
Um, but apparently contradictory evidence is not taken by Snow to refute the hypothesis. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, uh, this evidence supports it, but this doesn't, so it's not going to work out. Rather, what Snow does is he refines his hypothesis. He posits additional explanatory hypotheses, such as uh, the spread through the water, water supply, right? So, um, you know, uh, we see in, in the poor population, uh, people come into contact with uh, sort of the bodily fluids of sick people, uh, through everyday means. Rich people don't do that, right, in Snow's account. Uh, they uh, are led in, le in less close physical proximity. They have better hygiene um, uh, at this time. Um, but uh, the spread through the water supply explains why rich people also get it when they do get it, right? So, um, and in fact, uh, you know, an important part of this story that that uh, our tr traditional way of talking about hypothesis and evidence wouldn't uh, lead us to expect is the hy hypothesis. The hypotheses in question actually control the collection of evidence itself, right? Um, how how um, which evidence is seen as significant and where Snow goes to look for evidence, not um, uh, not just as a test, but as a way of further refining that hypothesis. So um, we can see how the hypothesis of the water supply leads Snow to make um, various observations about uh, water use, right? Try to understand what's really going on here. So um, the, the discussion of the different habits of water use by the English and the Scots in order to explain different cholera patterns among them, uh, cholera outbreak patterns among them is an important part of this. Now, because the collection of evidence is guided by the hypotheses that um, uh, Snow is, is making, which in turn, uh, you know, the hypothesis seeks to answer a certain question or solve a specific problem. This also explains certain gaps in the research, right? So Snow, uh, Goldstein and Goldstein point out, Snow came very close to recognizing a treatment for cholera, but he fell short here, primarily because um, the problem was how is cholera communicated and how can it be contained and not how can it be treated, right? That wasn't what Snow was concerned about. Um, and so that lead him, led him to ignore certain kinds of important evidence uh, to, the, the, to the latter question. Another interesting thing here that's worth mentioning is that Snow is able to provide compelling arguments about what causes cholera disease and what causes it to spread from person to person without using experiments to directly manipulate the factors, right? So often we, you know, in, in science and medicine, we establish causation through experimentation, right? We manipulate one variable, we measure another to determine their relationship, right? You are familiar with uh, the, the slogan, probably, correlation is not causation, or correlation does not imply causation, right? Um, uh, so, so simple like observational correlations are typically thought of as not enough. You need experimental evidence. But all Snow has in his uh, in his data and his body of evidence are are very particular kinds of correlational observational evidence, right? Um, so let's talk about two examples, and here they're uh, they're examples that that come close to but don't ever quite become experiments, right? The first is the case of the Broad Street pump, right? So there's this localized outbreak in this part of uh, London in 1854 near um, the Golden Square um, and, and Broad Street um, where, uh, you know, there's a, there's a high incidence of cholera. Snow uses this map here to, um, to indicate uh, a, a number of things. He shows here the number of uh, cases, right, in uh, with these little hash marks. Um, let me zoom in on that. So you can see these hash marks here um, uh, uh, stacked up. These are the, 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 the number of cases or deaths from cholera uh, in those particular areas, right? Um, so Snow proposed a kind of um, public health experiment here. Okay, well, so first of all, Snow's hypothesis about water supply says we should look for 
uh, we should look for uh, a source of um, uh, of the outbreak, and he centers things on this um, on this pump, right? This water pump on Broad Street. Broad Street. So in this part of the city, people didn't have running water in their house, and so if they wanted water, they had to go fill containers from this public water pump, right? So Snow proposed a public health experiment, right? Remove the handle to the pump, right? Require people to go elsewhere to get water uh, from other wells and see if the outbreak dies down, right? Um, when they have to go elsewhere. Unfortunately, Snow had trouble getting the council to agree, right? So by the time the handle was removed, the disease had basically run its course. Um, so the skeptic might say, okay, well, no correlation, uh, uh, or it, it is cor it's just correlation, so it's not causation, right? So you, you can't really conclude that the water supply was the, was the source, right? You know, incidentally, just as a, as a sort of historical marker, the pump is still there uh, in the original location. You can see there it is without a handle uh, on it. Um, it's outside a, a pub that's now been called or named the John Snow. Um, Broad Street, weirdly, has been renamed Broadwick Street. I'm not sure what's up that. But anyway, so the pump's still there. You can actually go see it uh, next time you're in London. Okay, so the, the Broad Street pump example, it provided some evidence, but it, you might, if you were skeptical, still deny that it was uh, evidence that the water supply uh, caused the outbreak. Okay. So a second major piece of evidence that Snow refers to uh, came in the 1853-1854 uh, cholera e epidemic uh, outbreak in London. Um, this map here shows um, uh, water companies, right? The, uh, so these are, these are places where there was running water um, and uh, where the water supply um, was provided by uh, two different companies who competed, right? Um, the Southwark and Vauxhall Company and the Lambeth Company. So Southwark and Vauxhall is in uh, blue, Lambeth is in red, and the overlap uh, purple is where they're both uh, both involved, right? Um, let's let's zoom in a little bit on that. So there you see, I've I've zoomed in and I've made the the color a little darker. Um, so uh, in that purplish area uh, where there is, um, uh, you know, overlap, you might have houses uh, very close to each other, even next door to one another in the same neighborhood, um, uh, and you're getting water from two different sources, right? Um, uh, the Southwark and Vahal Company, right, had much higher death rates from cholera, according to Snow. Um, and, or according to the, the evidence, actually, that Snow gathered. Um, and Snow attributes this difference to the different sources of their water. So um, the Southwark and Valhall Company, the, both companies drew the water from the River Thames that, run through the middle, that runs through the middle of London. If you look at the bigger map, you see the river there on the north, right? So we're looking at the south side of London, uh, and the river runs through the middle, um, the River Thames. Um, both companies were drawing their water from the Thames. But at a certain point, um, the Lambeth Company moved their, uh, uh, the place they were gathering the water from upstream of the city, whereas the Valhall, Southwark and Valhall Company, they were drawing water um, uh, from the Thames in the middle of the city. So a lot of waste from the city was pouring into the river, and they were drawing water out of it. Right? So that's how the water became contaminated. Um, and that's why, according to Snow, there were more deaths. Um, yeah, incidentally, when I lived uh, in London for three months uh, as a graduate student, um, that area of Camberwell on the map uh, is is where I uh, rented a rented a room. So, uh, very familiar area to me. So the reading discusses this case in terms of the difference between what they call nat laboratory experiments and, and nat natural experiments, right? So um, in a laboratory or you know, a clinical trial or any other type of um, genuine experiment, uh, you, the scientist, directly manipulates or assigns some variable that you think is the cause or explanation 
of a phenomenon that you're interested in, and then you measure the effect, right, of manipulating that, that variable. Um, in a natural exper experiment, it's as if nature herself has set up the experiment. So you don't do any direct manipulation, but you find a variable that's kind of randomly distributed in something like the way you would have assigned it, and then you look for differences in the results. So although you can't assign water companies to houses, um, the random sort of uh, result of, of free competition uh, got you something like uh, what you would have done, right? If you had if you had done a, a, a real experiment. Um, now we could you know learn a lot obviously by intentionally exposing subjects to different water sources, you know, intentionally infecting them with cholera or, you know, infect intentionally in, uh, tainted sources and then seeing how it spreads, right? Um, but, you know, the disease is fatal uh, uh, in that time period. Even today, it's, it's not, you know, we have good treatments for it, but it's not pleasant. Um, so this is like, um, this is an ethically problematic, unacceptable thing. Um, so Snow was lucky to find the natural experiment in this case, um, and he could look sort of retrospectively and make the causal determination without having to do something unethical. Um, now, in the end of, uh, at the end of the manuscript, um, Snow makes a variety of public health uh, recommendations for interve interventions to stop the spread of cholera. You might think of these as the ultimate experimental test for his research. Not that these were experiments that Snow himself conducted, but these recommendations, when put into practice, did prevent uh, uh, cholera epidemics um, in places like London. And, uh, you know, you, you might think that that's really where um, uh, the, the tests of, of his research uh, came, came into being, right? So that's the case of Jon Snow and the research on cholera that kind of founded epidemiology. Um, of course, you know, it's important to point out that this is one example uh, of, of, of science. So we should wonder, you know, what can we conclude about how science itself works from one example? Important, part, uh, to, uh, important point to think about when we're doing history and philosophy of science together. But insofar as, you know, we think Snow was onto something, um, it's important to look at his, his, his example as we sort of interrogate maybe simplistic uh, pictures of how science works. So uh, that's, uh, that's it for today. Um, I look forward to hearing what you think about this e example and uh, uh, about the larger issues it raises. Um, and so I will see you in our class discussion or uh, I will continue the conversation with you on Discord or in the comments here. Um, otherwise, uh, I will see you next week.